what makes us interesting is the walk-bike transit connection and the multi-mobility that allows you to live comfortably without a car. I've been promoting Cycling Vancouver for 10 years and I am so thrilled by the change in our city. And so they started building protected bike lanes, first in the city centre and then into the more outlying areas. It's really changed the type of people you see on bikes here. Women, children, more of the elderly. And to watch the city change while our children are growing and watch them adapt to the new city and the new places they can get to has been pretty spectacular. And that's helping us achieve our Transportation 2040 target, which in 2020 is supposed to be walking and cycling and transit being at 50%. And so we were pleased to be able to tell Council that we've already achieved a 50% sustainable transportation mode split. The story of Vancouver city making has really three primary events. The first in the late 1960s, early 1970s was the famous rejection of the freeways. We're the only North American city that has no freeways within our city limits. There was a plan to have a major network of freeways, of urban freeways around Vancouver, including a waterfront expressway that was planned to go sort of right plow through most of those buildings here and actually come right under here. So this plaza that we're on, this building, was part of that uh, 1960s expressway vision. Uh, and of course, local residents in Vancouver opposed a uh, vision of more cars and more freeways and instead set about building a region, a city that was more focused on walking, cycling and transit. And so instead of building a waterfront expressway that was intended to cross the Burrard Inlet, this body of water uh, over here and, and over to the North Shore, a bunch of that money was reallocated and put into the C bus service. So the C bus is one of the first high capacity transit links built in this region. And so now it operates every 15 minutes throughout the day. So that's you know more than 50 sailings a day. It really just takes about 10 minutes to get across there. It's a, it's a really popular service and can carry about 400 passengers. In our downtown, it looks a lot like Hornby. Uh, where we have protected bike lanes. 24% of our network now is considered for all ages and abilities and we're excited. We're seeing more children, uh, more new people cycling. It's the fastest growing mode, over 30%. We're over 130,000 trips a day. 10% uh, commute to work. The second event was Expo 86. That rejection of the freeways led up to uh, building a different model of people living downtown, multimodal city making, that really culminated with Expo 86, which had a theme of transportation of the future. And it led to, a, a, as a catalyst, a lot of the transformation of the waterfront that we're now fairly famous for. Vancouver seawall is routinely ranked as the best public space in at least Canada, and it's world renowned, of course. All ages and ability also means our, our wonderful seawall. And so uh, that's another part, especially for thinking of people cycling, not just from a commute perspective, but how they want to get around, uh, enjoying parts of Vancouver, uh, and going to destinations. The best thing about it is how beautiful it is as you move through it. And one of the criticisms, including from me, has been that we need more places, more sticky spaces on our, on our seawall that are places to go and enjoy, not just move through. We often say the best transportation plan is a great land use plan, so it really flows from the land use. So we're standing on Granville Street in downtown Vancouver, and in the 1970s there was a decision made to, to turn this street into a transit mall. Uh, so it's a busy arterial coming onto the downtown peninsula, and the car traffic is, uh, is directed to the two parallel streets. And for this whole stretch of, uh, of one of uh, downtown Vancouver's premier streets, it's accessible only to transit uh, buses and taxis. And then the third event was more recently, 2010, when we hosted the Winter Olympics. And we upped our game again in terms of not only mode shift towards walking, biking, and transit. We were the most urban uh, Winter Olympics ever held. And we closed down streets and the viaducts. And we showed that the world didn't end when we did that. We used the streets to have parties instead and have great civic celebration. So it's the three big events and the time in between used smartly that really has led to the city that we have now. We're constantly talking about 2008 as a turning point and it was the uh, new mayor and council that came into office and uh, they, they shifted their strategy from um, recreational and sports cycling to enabling transport cycling. We moved to Vancouver about nine years ago and kind of thought it was the great place, a great place to end up with our children. So we were living in suburbia in eastern Canada and this place was just so green and fresh. They're at the age right now of seven and ten where they're starting to test their boundaries and we're starting to experiment with giving them some free reign. We like to think we prepared 
them for that process in the in the best way possible by allowing them to negotiate their own streets. They recognize that getting around by car is a nice thing to do once in a while and sometimes is necessary, but they would much rather go around on foot and by bike or on public transit. They love the SkyTrain. Here we are in the platform at uh, Main Street Station on the SkyTrain system. Uh, it's actually the world's longest automated light rail system and uh, with 53 stations uh, as soon as we open the Evergreen Line extension and with frequencies that come every 90 seconds to 108 seconds uh, during the peak periods. It's amazing. I mean, if you miss one train, another one is, uh, is along in a little over a minute. And it's that frequency that really makes the SkyTrain network so powerful and popular. So Vancouver finally has a bike sharing program. It's called Mobi, which basically means we brought more bikes to the city of Vancouver. Uh, we launched on July 20th. There are 600 bikes on the street right now and we're building up to 1,500 at 150 stations. We had 4,000 people sign up as founding members within the first few weeks. It's a game changer for Vancouver. Between all of the new protected bike lanes that the city built downtown and the launch of our bike share system, we are going to see so many more people riding bikes. And so for me, as a user, I've got my transit pass, I now have my, my Moby Bike Share membership to use if I want, but I of course have my own bike. And by the way, if we need a car, we've got literally the most successful car share system anywhere in North America. So I've got choices, and the, the, the best thing is to have not just uh, available choices, but delightful choices every day. And that's been built up over decades, generations of city making, that is really now, in the last while, coming together uh, with a real multimodal success story that's really working well. I think Vancouver has shown that a bike-friendly mayor and council um, can get re-elected over and over again, if, even if the media pushes back, even if there's some certain segments of the business community that push back. There is that latent demand. People do want walkable, bikeable cities. You are going to generate a lot of bike lash and you're going to get a lot of noise and you just need to push through that. 2016, the city is 50% of trips are now by walking, biking and transit. Uh, so what you see is you see a safer downtown. You see cars being much more respectful of cyclists. We were, haven't lightened up enough uh, as a city in terms of getting into this kind of messy, gritty city making until relatively recently. It was the Viva Vancouver program, taking spaces like this, like a, a closed Robson Street that get, has been seasonally closed every year since we closed it down for the 2010 Winter Olympics, and now finally the decision to permanently close it. But all sorts of examples around the city starting to happen that you would call tactical urbanism or pop-up urbanism. The good news is uh, we're trying to absorb that learning curve uh, on tactical urbanism or placemaking very fast. There's a lot of great cities that Vancouver can be learning from at the same time as other cities are coming to Vancouver to learn. From.